Okay, so we've been uh, talking about the Shema. I said we're going to move on to the Amida, but um, I, I forgot we have other paragraphs of the Shema that we needed to get to first. So we're going to just briefly touch on some other points, and then we're going to turn our attention to the Amida. So we spent last week talking about Shema, the first verse, the verse of Shema, and we, we came to the conclusion that the Shema represents a, uh, a, uh, an awareness of God's of God's um, absolute oneness, right? That there's no other existence aside from God. Then, right after the Shema, we move on to Baruch Shem Kivod Machuto Olam Ba'ed. That's the next line, which we say quietly, right? So we say Shema out loud, we cover our eyes, then we say Baruch Shem quietly, and then we say Ve'ahavta out loud. Why do we say Baruch Shem quietly? We've talked, touched on the fact that we say it loud on Yom Kippur because we're like angels, but the Talmud tells us that um, that Jacob, towards the end of his life, was, wasn't sure if his children were going to keep up the traditions and the faith that he had given them, that he had taught them. He wasn't sure if they were going to remain faithful to the God of Israel. So he wanted to gauge what was going on. And it says that Jacob calls his children. He wants to tell them what happens at the end of days. And, um, and in, other words, in other words, when Mashiach is going to come. And suddenly that divine spirit, that insight that he had, escaped him. Suddenly he lost the divine spirit. And he was afraid that the reason was because his kids are not worthy of it. Maybe they weren't deserving. Maybe they were not planning on keeping up the tradition. So he gets nervous. So he says to his children, I uh, want to make sure that you guys are, are true and faithful to God. So the boy said, all his sons said, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Achad. They proclaimed that oneness of God to express their trust and their faith, their, their faith and their, their um, commitment to, to God and to Judaism. When Jacob heard them say it, he said, Baruch Shem Kivod Machoto Leolam Ba'ed. That was his response. So since that was his response, and therefore we incorporate that into our prayers. We say Shema, and then we say Baruch Shem. However, the Baruch Shem is not part of the prayer. If you open up the Torah, and you see the, the section of the Shema, so it goes, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and then from there it goes into the Ahavta at Hashem Elokecha. Baruch Shem is not a verse in the Torah. So since it's not really part of the Torah, we want to have Jacob's response, but we also want to say the Shema as it's necessary, so we say it quietly. That's the reason we say Baruch Shem quietly. Now, aside from the historical anecdote that Jacob um, says Baruch Shem in response to his children saying Shema, what's the significance? So we mentioned the Shema is when we affirm God's absolute oneness. And by his oneness, we mean that he's the only true existence. There's just God. There's nothing else. Baruch Shem is, is an attempt to take that oneness of God, that absolute oneness of God where nothing else exists, and bring it into that, let's call it illusionary existence, right? We don't have time. We're not, we're not, this is not the place for us to discuss the, the nature of existence. It's not, the, it's not the point here. But whatever the case is, we certainly are human beings that are created, that exist, that live in a world that exists. So how do we reconcile these two things? We have to take that Shema Yisrael, that absolute oneness of God, and then we have to bring it into the world. And that's what Baruch Shem is all about. But if you look at the words of Baruch Shem, all of those words represent a drawing now. Baruch, blessed, which is a blessing. A blessing, what, why do you bless somebody? Because you want to take energy that seems to sometimes be stuck or trapped above and draw it down. Baruch also is from the word Hamavrich, uh, like to, uh, to channel, to channel, to flow energy, right? Shem, the name, a name is only necessary when there's somebody else, right? If you're the only existence, you don't need a name. So the fact that God even has a name is so that he can be identified by others. So we see Baruch Shem, those are two words that connote otherness. Kivod, the glory, the same thing is true with glory. What's, what's the glory and honor if there's nobody else to appreciate it, to benefit from it, right? Baal his rulership, his kingship, his sovereignty, what's there to be sovereign over if you're the only existence? So, right, so sovereignty also represents otherness, Right? Olam to the world, and va'ed, for all time. Time and space are creations. So time and space, olam va'ed, that represents a drawing of that oneness of God into our created reality. So it's the perfect response to the Shema Yisrael. We say the Shema, and we contemplate on God's absolute oneness, and that he's the only real existence. And then we say, you know, it's very nice for us to escape our realities, to go recognize God's true reality, but what's it have to do with me? So Baruch Shem is bringing that, channeling that, accessing that, and bringing it into our, into our reality, into our created world, into our sort of sense of, of self. 
So that's the Shema and the Baruch Shem. Uh, God willing, tomorrow we'll touch on the Ahafta and the Haya in Shemoah. That'll be for tomorrow. Let's finish with um, a thought on today's Chumash and Tanya.